In this video, I'm going to talk about some very interesting Excel tricks. By the end of the video, please let me know in the comments which tricks did you not know of and which of the ones did you find the most helpful. No further ado, let's go see them together. Trick number one, how do you add data to your charts really fast? Now this trick is going to be insanely simple, but very, very productive. The shortcut that I'm going to speak about, people have literally built their entire careers using that shortcut. Nevertheless, please take a look. So I have this little chart right here, and the chart is made up of two columns right here. So the first column is the products column. The second column is the year, which are actually in the bars. A few months later, you get uh, 2021 data, and you would want to add 2021 data to the chart. How do you do that really fast? Well, most often people are going to select the chart and then drag the range right here. That's one way to do it. No problem. But, but the fastest way that I believe to do it is just literally use the control C shortcut. So select the data, control C on that, select the chart and control V on that. Awesome. Trick number two, chart formatting. Let's just say that you're trying to build a presentation and in that presentation, you have a lot of slides that contain charts and you would want all the charts to look the same, the same formatting, the same style and things like that. Let's just say that we're working with this data, months and revenue, and we have already done some work to be able to make the chart look a certain way. The red labels right here, the data labels right here, and all of that is the work that I have done to format the chart to make it look a certain way. Now, the problem is that the next time that I wanna make a chart, so I select the data and I use the shortcut Alt F1 and I get a chart, but this chart looks nowhere like this and I have to do all of the clicks once again to be able to format the chart. Is there a faster way? Yes, there is. So I'm again going to use the same shortcut like I did. So control C on that. But wait, do not press control V. I'm going to select the chart and use paste special. And the shortcut that I use for that is Alt E S and I get the paste special box and I'm going to paste the formats from the chart that I copied formats, click on OK, and you're going to see that the chart starts to look that way. Now, obviously, you can arrange the size and make the chart in a similar size, but the chart formatting is just copied and pasted. Awesome. Trick number three, unpivoting using Excel. Let's just say that you're stuck in the stone age and for some reason your company has not upgraded to any of the later versions of Excel. So you don't have access to Power Query, which is a beautiful tool to unpivot the data. Nevertheless, you are working with Excel and you want to unpivot the data. Take a look at by what do I mean by unpivoting. So if I just maybe go over to this Excel, you can see that on here in the rows here, we have the months. In the columns here, we have the products. And if I have to read 100, I have to look up on the top and I have to look here on the left. This data is cross tabulated, hence pivoted. And to be able to work with this data, I need to unpivot the data. I'm going to use a pivot table for this particular thing. So what do I do? I select the entire data and then I use the shortcut Alt DP to initiate the old pivot table wizard that was there back in Excel 2003. So uh, we are right here. And once the pivot table dialog box opens up, I'm going to click on multiple consolidation ranges, click on next. I will create a page field, click on next. It asks you, hey, where is the data? I'm going to select the entire data, click on add, the data gets added, next. And I'm going to build a pivot table on the new worksheet. Click on finish. Now, if you take a look at this pivot table and the data that we left on the previous sheet, both of them look the same. There is no change. I still have to read 170 up on the top and here on the left. So what's the difference? Well, this pivot table created, now we can actually double click on the value of the cell and get all the details of that number. So if I happen to double click on the grand total right here, I am going to get the data in an unperverted format. So the column headers need to be changed, obviously, and this is going to become month, this is going to become the product, and that can be the value. And now with this data, you can make any kind of pivot table that you would want. Remember to trigger the old pivot table wizard to unpivot the data. And from here on, you can work with a regular pivot table. Quick interruption in case you're liking the video thus far, you're absolutely going to love my courses on Power BI, DAX, data modeling, M language and Power Query. I have these structured courses where I start talking about concepts, fundamental concepts right from scratch. And then I take the students to the next level by talking about how to think, how to construct the logic of the problem and start solving harder problems on your own. Hundreds and thousands of students have joined my courses and they have provided some raving feedback. In case you're interested, the link of the courses is going to be down in the description. I look forward to seeing you inside the course. Let's get back to the video. The next trick, how do you break the data into multiple sheets from a single data source? So let's just say that I'm working with this data and I just want to break the data into multiple sheets, one for every single region. So I have regions right here and I would like to break the regions into multiple sheets. So North occupies one sheet, East occupies one sheet, so on and so forth. How do you do that? You can actually do it using a pivot table. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first of all convert this into a table, which I've already done that using the control T shortcut and I have a table design tab up on the top. 
Next, I'm going to make a pivot table using this. So I will go ahead in the insert tab. We have a pivot table from table range, picks up that range, put the pivot table on the new worksheet. And once you have the pivot table, we will start to drag all the fields that were there in that pivot table. So I will just go ahead and drag the date, everything into rows. So um, sales rep, I will put that customer, I will put the amount, I will put the profit, and I'll put the region as well. And you can see that uh, the date has been summarized into years and quarters and months. I don't really want that. So I can just remove the summarization from here. So I don't want the dates. Uh, years, I don't want the quarters, I don't want the months, and I just want the dates. Now, at the moment, the data looks something like this. I just want to format this data so that it looks like a data and not the pivot table. So I'm going to click on the data right here. In the design tab, I will make sure that I do not have any kind of subtotals or grand totals, and the grand totals are also off. And I'll make sure that the report layout is in the tabular format, which is already there. The next, the next thing that I'm going to do is I am also going to repeat all the item labels so that the dates are repeated right here. It still looks like a pivot table, so I'm just going to use the minimal format, which is the first one, to make it more look like a data set. Now, once you have uh, you know, this kind of pivot table, which is looking like a data, what you can do is you can actually go ahead and take your region, put that up in the filters as well. Now, once you have done that, what you're going to do is you will apply a report filter pages feature on this particular pivot table. How, how do you do that? So I'm going to go over to the pivot table analyze tab. In the options drop down, you're going to see that we have report filter pages. Once I click on that, every single region right here is going to create a page of its own, which is right here as well. So I'm going to click on OK and notice that how my pages change here at the bottom. So once I click on OK, you're going to see that I now get a page for every single region. So we have East, North, South, South Central, West, and these are nothing but my pivot tables. And sure enough, just in case the main data changes, you can come back and refresh this. This data will also automatically change. And we have been able to split the data into multiple sheets using a pivot table. The next trick, dynamic ranges. This is going to completely blow your minds out in case you already do not know that. So please take a look. So again, the similar data, we have months and products. But hey, I want to take a look at the sum at the bottom of the data. So how would you go about it? You would probably write something like a total. If you already know the shortcut, you're going to select all the data and use Alt equals to sign to kind of sum the entire range. And sure enough, we have summed the entire range. But let's just say that this sheet is being shared across multiple teams and people are supposed to add months or add products. Then in that case, people are just going to probably cut this total, paste it somewhere down below. And rather than adding in the adjacent row, somebody added the August month right here with some numbers, probably let's say 10 in every single column. Now, obviously, the total was stopping up until the row number nine. Anything that is not adjacent is probably not going to be added right here. So 10 is obviously not added. What I would want my totals to behave is that no matter where the total gets added in the blank rows right above the formula, the total should be added. How do I build a dynamic range for that? Now, what are we going to do is we're going to build a dynamic cell naming technique. So. In case you don't already know it, cell naming is nothing but selecting a cell and then in the name box, you can name it. But we are going to use a formula to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select on any particular cell. Then I'm going to open the cell naming name manager. You can also do that using the formula bar up on the top. So in the formulas, you have name manager. I use the shortcut control F3. And once you're there, you're going to click on the new. In the new, I'm going to call this as my previous cell. That's the name of the cell. Now, instead of referring it to C15, which is the current cell address, I will rather refer it to the previous cell, which is going to be C14. And the way that I do that is by removing any kind of dollar sign so that it's relative. So I will remove the name of the sheet. I will keep the exclamation mark. And I'm also not going to have any kind of dollars. And, and that is just C14. That's the way it is. Exclamation mark, C14. That's all about it. Click on OK. And that's my previous cell. Click on close and the name has been given. Now, obviously, because that's a relative reference, if I happen to write equals to previous cell, it is going to refer to the previous cell. And because the previous cell is blank, it is going to give you zero. But if should I happen to write a hello, it's going to give you hello. And this is dynamic. That means if I come right here and if I say previous cell, it is actually referring to the previous cell, which is currently also blank. But how does all of that help? So let's just go back to our formula, which is where we started our sum range from cell C3. Sure enough, I would like to start from there, but I do not want to end at row number nine. I want to end at the previous cell. So now you see it. I'm going to cancel out C9 and I'm going to write previous cell right here. 
Close that uh, brackets, press enter, drag the formula to the right, and we sure enough have 10 added, but let's just test it out. So I'm gonna control X on that, maybe copy down a few rows, and then I'm just gonna maybe add 20 in all of these cells right here. So 20, press enter, and you're gonna see that the total automatically updates to 649 and so on and so forth. This is incredibly awesome. Now, should you want to uh, apply this in a columnar fashion, you can also just kind of have previous cell right here and then just kind of do that te technique of naming the cell and then referring it to a range. But you now get a dynamic range. The next trick, defining custom sort order. There are a lot of times when you would want to sort a particular thing in a certain order, not by the alphabetical or ascending or descending order. Like the way that we sort months in India, we always start from April, that's when our financial year starts, and we end in the month of March, that is where our financial year ends. So I don't really wanna see months from January to December. Maybe when I'm kind of working with Excel in India with my own data, I always wanna sort the data from April to March. Is there a way that we can set the default sort order of the months from April to March? Whenever, whatever data that I work with, whenever I apply sort, it is sorted from April to March. Yes, there is. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna just type out the names of the months in Excel. So I will obviously start with April. I'll copy that, paste that right here. And I will kind of end with March. So Jan, Feb and March go right up until the end. This is a manual entry that I have done. It doesn't make a difference. Once I store this into Excel, Excel will remember this, that this is the sort order that you would want. One thing to remember is that at the moment I have used the three letter month names right here. In case you write J-U-L-Y in your actual data and you sort it by J-U-L, the sorting will not apply. Make sure that the way that you write the months and your data is in the consistent format. Once you've done that, you will just select this particular range and go over to Excel options. The shortcut that I used to go to Excel options is Alt F T and that opens up Excel options. Once we're there, we're gonna to go to advanced. In advanced, I'll scroll right at the bottom and that's where I have edit custom lists. Once you click on that, you're gonna see that here are all the custom lists and I can just maybe uh, click on that, click on add, uh, click on import actually. So the list is selected right here. I click right here, I click on import. Now my current list has already been added. You can see that right here, I've already added April, May, June, July, so on and so forth. In case you wouldn't have added it, it would show right here and then you can click on add that shows up right here. Now once you're done, click on okay and you come out of it. Next time you wanna sort anything, a pivot table, a slicer or any of the other elements, you will have this custom sort order there in your Excel and you would be able to sort the data magically in the order that you would want. All right, the last trick, trick number seven. How do you calculate financial year, quarters and years for your dates if you are working in any other country that does not support Jan to December years? So you can take a look that we have the months right here and the months are all the way from January up until December. But in India, obviously we follow the year starting April. So this is where my financial year starts onwards here. This is where my financial year starts. So obviously, if I'm trying to find out quarters, this is going to be my Q1. And this is going to be the next three months are going to be my Q2. The next three months are going to be my Q3. And for the next year, 2025, if these dates would have been for 2025, these would have been my Q4. How do you then accommodate for quarters which are customized to your own financial year? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to write some simple formulas. Now, what we're going to do is, first of all, since my financial year is delayed by three months, so Jan, Feb, and March, I do not consider my financial year to begin in the first three months. I will delay my date by three months. So I'm going to use a formula equals to E date. I'll pick up the date and I'll delay that, that by three date. And all that I'm going to get is a date which is three months back. Press enter, drag the formula down to the rest of the cells. And if you just maybe convert that into a date format, you're gonna see that the Jan date becomes October date, Feb dates become November date, so on and so forth. It's just three months behind, simple as that. Now, once the date has been pushed three months back, I'm gonna find the month number of that particular date using the formula equals to month around the edate function, close the bracket and press enter. This gives you a date format, but worry not, I'm gonna convert, convert it back to a general format, shortcut, control, shift, and tilt. Now, you can see that Jan obviously is the first month, but the three months delayed date is October date, and hence we get the month number as 10, so on and so forth, and we get something like this. Once we have the month numbers of the delayed date, what we're going to do is we're going to apply a multiplier of three. Why multiplier of three? Because in one quarter, you have three months. So what we're going to say that, hey, whatever number you have, one through 12, please have a multiple of three. So I'm going to use the ceiling function for that. 
ceiling function, first part, what is your number? So my number could be anywhere between 1 through 12. And the multiplier that I would want is a 3. So comma 3. And this is going to produce like a table of 3. So you will have 3s, 6s, 9s, and 12s, just a multiple of 3. Press enter and you drag it down. And you're going to have uh, 12s or 3s or 6 or 9s. Simple as that. Now, once you have a multiple of 3, the reason why we did that is because a multiple of 3 is also divisible by 3. So if I happen to divide that by 3, you're going to be able to find the quarter. And 12 divided by 3 is going to give you Q to quarter 4. I drag that down. Obviously, I attach a little Q at the start just to make it look pretty and all. And press enter and drag this formula down. And that is nothing but my quarter. Now, at the moment, this formula is good, but the problem is that every single time you want to use it, you'll have to write this gigantic formula. Maybe people don't even understand this formula, so they'll be perplexed. Now, we can convert this formula into a lambda function, something like this. All right, so I've already written the code or the formula for the lambda function. All that I'm saying is that I want to work with a date. It could be any date, and that's my variable. I also want to supply the month ending number. That means which month are you ending your fiscal year? Currently for us, it's the month of March. So you would have a month ending number. And then we just wrote the very formula that we're going to use. And we're just going to maybe feed these inputs in our formula. So this is the very formula that I wrote. And all that I'm going to do is feed the parts of the formula with the variables that I have used. Nothing that complicated. So now I'm going to take this lambda function, control C on that, come back to my Excel and declare a formula. So I will use the name manager once again, make a new name. I'm going to call this as fiscal quarter. And here I will just delete all of that and paste my lambda function right here. And let's just validate that real quick. This seems okay. Click on okay. And that's my lambda function. Now, if I want to get the same result using the lambda function, I will use instead a fiscal quarter formula that I just created. I will put in the date and the optional input, which is three uh, at the moment, because my year ends in March and put, start the bracket, close the bracket and press enter. And this is going to give you the same output. But this formula is far easier for somebody to use. Now I know what you're thinking, could there be a lambda function for financial year as well? Sure enough, there is. So I've made the simple lambda function for financial year as well, which is pretty much using the same logic. It's just asking for date and the year and month number. And depending upon where you are on the month, it just kind of concatenates dates and years together to produce the financial year. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this particular formula. You can take a look at it, download the file, and I'm going to go back to my Excel, control F3 to open up the name manager, make a new name. I'm going to call this as fiscal year, and I'm going to stick my Lambda function right here, delete everything, and then stick my Lambda function right here. Click on OK, click on close, and we are now good to go. So let's just try to use that. So fiscal year, What's my date? My date is right here. What's my financial year end month? In case you do not provide the financial year end month, this is going to obviously uh, have that set to 12 because you're ending in December. That's the default. So that's an optional input. Press enter and this is going to give you the financial year right here, something like this. So 2023, 2024, and then this is where in the month of April, the new year sets in and that's 2024 and 2025. That is awesome.